to speak the truth frankly and boldly. Nor need we shrink from honestly facing conditions in our country today. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes needed efforts <laughs> to convert... It's taking its time. There we go. <laughs> All right. So, good day, good noon, good afternoon to all of those all of you who are watching today, I'm so glad you're able to join me. I'm really, really uh, excited to have this conversation. I'm Della Rucker. I'm the principal of the Wise Economy Workshop. And my guest today on Accelerate Us Dispatches from the Front Lines of the Local Economy Revolution is a writer in the space and a, and a thinker and a speaker in in a space that we don't hear enough from. And I've been kind of frustrated personally with the lack of what we hear in from this perspective um, for a very long time. So Kristen Jeffers is also known as the Black Urbanist and her, her voice, her perspective, her understanding of how our cities work and how our cities sometimes don't work or don't work the way they should is is one that i've looked to for for insight for 10 years probably more than that mm -hmm. um so kristen i'm i'm delighted that you were willing to take time i know that this is a berserk period <laughs> yeah. in history for 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 you on multiple levels mm -hmm. and so taking the time today is just i'm super grateful for it um why don't you start by helping because because some people may know you some people may not um it's a pretty wide-ranging audience here mm -hmm. so why don't you talk tell us a little bit about um kind of who you are what you focus on and you know a little bit of why this matters to you so to start at the beginning like i like to start at so it started with a map on the floor so i grew up in greensburg north carolina i am a only child i was born in 1985 and i am I mean, I may look a little lighter, but I am a fully black American and I'm still actually been told that there's some other ethnicities, but that's been a journey I've been taking more recently. But about 10 years ago, probably before that, because I've been I got my first writing award when I was in elementary school. I was reading. My mom had me reading at age four. She's a retired now classroom teacher. My father is now deceased, but he retired before he passed away as a licensed electrician. And so they met because dad walked into mom's classroom to fix the lights. <laughs> and <laughs> dad was also, um, he, uh, he was um, employed by the school system uh, and Guilford County Schools. We have an all encompassing county school system um, in the Greensboro area that includes if you are aware of Greensboro, whether you're ACC fans or the Greensboro sit-in or somehow the barbecues wafted. And um, there's a handful of us famous people. If you're a Rhiannon Giddens fan, if you're in the Americana yeah. music, there's a lot of folks who are also rooted in this area. This is Tobacco Road. So we're kind of on the um, far, far end of that. We don't, none of the teens that are considered part of the Tobacco Road legacy are there, but we also have North Carolina A&T State University. We have mm -hmm. University of North Carolina at Greensboro, which was a legacy uh, women's college that was state run at one point in time. Oh. My mom is a um, graduate of Bennett College, which along with Spelman College are two remaining black women's or, or women identified or folks who are um, uh, assigned females that welcomed schools for black mm -hmm. people. So what kind of the women, the remaining women's only spaces. And so my mom graduated from there in 1976. Oh went to work for the school system, met my dad in the early 80s. They have me in 1985, take me to a neighborhood in Greensboro that's about a mile south of downtown, originally built for white families. Uh, mm -hmm. We lived in the part that was um, 
a, a single family homes, like three, two bedroom, one bathroom, picture window, full kitchen. Um, the kitchen was important. <laughs> there was a defined living room in this house, a mm. defined bathroom and two defined bedrooms. Met, sizable backyard that I used to play in. My parents got me like a Sears swing set. Um, they got a lot of stuff from Sears. My my dad's <laughs> Sears car was very, very full. <laughs> we spent a lot of time there. Uh, but the kind of the key point is when you look up the address there, you notice that there is a restrictive covenant. And there's actually senior pro, uh, pro public housing for folks who are 55 and above. Mm -hmm. And then regular family size public housing, like younger families. But all of that was white only. Greensboro had two public housing developments in their initial inception of um, federally provided public housing. There was Morningside Homes, which became a Hope Six project. It was converted. Some of it was torn down. It resembled military barracks, and that's where Black families lived. Smith Homes, which was more like townhomes, a row, like more like row homes, and then there were kind of pieces that looked more like you know the, the one-story single-family homes. Mm -hmm. Those are for white families. And both of them have shopping centers attached, but the mm -hmm. one closest to Smith Homes lasted the longest. It had a Winn-Dixie grocery store until around 1970. Uh, the site grocery Terry is a really good sort of history of how grocery and food deserts have moved. And the founder of that is a gay man from Greensboro. So the, the North Carolina section is pretty fleshed out as far as if you want to watch um, how grocery stores moved and how they chased white hmm. families to s different neighbors. I wouldn't even say suburban because, again, this is North Carolina. This is Greensboro. We have a downtown square. We have the factory villages like the, the Revolution Mill Village, which is the textile. And uh, of course, High Point is far enough away. But of course, now with the airport and the industrial parks, everything has grown together. So effectively, anybody, you know, Greensboro, you kind of you and you know, the economic and the community development atmosphere. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm rooted. I'm rooted and grounded in Greensboro, Guilford County, the Piedmont Triad, that whole central North Carolina climate of economic community development and urban development or, mm -hmm. or rural development. The, yeah. the connection we have to rural life, both parents grew up on very small farms, not working farms, but they grew stuff on their property and occasionally they might trade it with someone else. They worked on bigger farms that years and years ago would probably have been plantations. So that's, that's a legacy that's there. And so I have known all of this. These are family stories. We would sit around a dinner table and talk about who owned what land and mm -hmm. who lived where. And my grandmother and my father actually drove the school bus. This was back when they let students drive the yellow school buses and we had yellow school buses. And so that was a family story that oh. my my dad and my grandmother, now it's my, my mom's mom and then my dad. So not, you know, not the same. Yeah. That wasn't like a generational line there, but they both in two separate counties, oh. my grandmother in Alamance County and my father in Guilford County, almost a generation later, uh, oh. both drove the school bus. Now my dad graduated in 1978 from high school. So I think he was on the tail end of students being able to drive a school bus. But once again, this is a family story. Uh, all these different family stories tied to places, tied to the shopping mall. Um, my dad and I, we had... Um, we kind of had neighborhood schools. My mom was being a classroom teacher, concerned about just labeling, even labeling on the high end. She worried that I might, they, my test scores were off the charts around kindergarten. She worried that I might not apply myself. Mm -hmm. So she said, okay, I know how this system works. I know how labeling works. Let me see if I can get her to a different neighborhood school. And so mm -hmm. I did take, I will admit that there were educational advantages there was the privilege of me being the only child. Mm -hmm. Even though my parents divorced, they were still cordial to me. They loved me and they still involved me. Uh, dad got into the bringing maps home. He was working not only as an electrician, but he was delivering papers that night mm -hmm. for the news and record. He was delivering to truck stops. The truck mm -hmm. stops were full of maps. So that he brought home the maps. Uh, he would wire different houses and churches and like community entities in the black community. And some of us white colleagues as well, but he would just mm -hmm. be wiring houses all over Guilford County on the weekends. And sometimes he would take me with him and he would pay me $5. Okay. 
mom sewed on her Kenmore sewing machine, which is still nailed to the table and sturdy, <laughs> very sturdy. I wish I had her Kenmore with me instead of the poor Ikea that I've been trying to use to get my textile, my little textile mm. venture going. It, she, but she taught me how to lay out fabric. She has 4-H ribbons for uh, fabric and clothing design. She considered clothing design at Bennett, but ended up mm. going into education. And then of course she had me at the library, had me reading golden books, you know, that's sort of the growing up context that I brought. Um, I did, wrote my first blog when I was in high school, so the early aughts, so right around 2003, 2004, mm -hmm. things like MySpace, Zanga, Black Planet, um, GeoCities were circulating. Mm -hmm. And by this time, my mom had been back in the classroom um, now for about maybe five or six years. So she went, she had taken, she had stepped out of the classroom. My parents married and brought me into the world, divorced, went back to the classroom. Dad was still working. So they alternated time with me. And oftentimes I would, and that was another reason we kind of, how we sort of exploited the education system. Mm -hmm. Her school was not in my, the zone we lived in. She wanted that residential privacy. So she wasn't running into her students, but we were in an adjacent zone. We also had something where black students could sort of exchange school mm -hmm. zones if the demographics supported it. So oftentimes there were some white students who would who could stay in predominantly black zones or black students who wanted, you know, the perceived change in educational experience. Or in the case of my family, I'm a child of a school a school system worker. Sure. That was something that people have used and it wasn't as frowned upon. Now, in some districts, in some cases, yeah, that's been become an issue. But at least in my case, it was more of transportation. Yeah. Um, having me there also, you know, with because my parents were both employees of the school system and there had been some, you know, domestic issues and also health issues. Being able to have me with my mom at her school district. Sure. which meant for middle school, I went to her school. I did not uh -huh. have her as a teacher in the seventh grade. Uh -huh. And the way the school complex was configured, we had about three buildings, three separate buildings with like the little like um, awnings attaching them. So yeah. her team of um, classes was in the main building. We had uh -huh. an annex for the seventh grade. And then there was a whole set of mobile units next to the annex. Then there was Which was very common for for schools in the in the South in that time period. Oh yeah, absolutely. We absolutely had mobile units, and in fact, at one point, Dad had gotten some kind of promotion where he was supervising mobile unit installations. But oh. ended up going back to just being a regular electrical like maintenance person. But yeah, so this was kind of a normal setup. Uh, there was a mobile unit just for the bus guy, and Mom and the bus guy were good friends. But I spent a lot of time on our campus, like literally either in my mom's classroom. Mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time helping her pack up her bags. Unfortunately, she was always the teacher that had the moves. So there was sort of inner mm -hmm. teacher dynamics. She is a lot of people's first and only black teacher. But there were about, I would say, 10 to 12 black teacher level. We had a assistant. I had an assistant principal who was black, actually two at the time. And my, they all knew each other. They all remember when mm -hmm. they were all teaching, they were around the same age group and they all kind of shared the struggles of going through public education, even in a county and a state that was well-funded at the time. Mm -hmm. And that hasn't had, has had some struggles with underfunding, but not some of the same struggles that other systems have and specifically system metro areas with a multiplicity of districts that are basically servicing just pods, elementary, middle, high school pods. Yep. And so I effectively switched from one pod to another, but it was still in the same district. And then I just went on to the high school. I kept my sort of exemption, but I was given the option to just opt back into my original high school cluster. Then I opted, so I got the scholarship money to stay in state and actually go to NC State University study communication, considered studying graphic design and architecture, lived with design students. And so this was the mid aught. So right around from 2004 to 2008, 2008, 2007, 2008, I actually um, graduated from, uh, with a communication degree about a semester early. I kind of headed off a little bit of the recession, but still got caught in. 
was laid off from a program director position at a nonprofit supporting venture capital exchange in um, the Durham area, in the Research Triangle area. And I had been kind of casually writing a more adult blog. It wasn't just me mm -hmm. ranting on like the, the social networks of the time. <laughs> Which was I, uh, the cool thing to do. Yes. <laughs> the prequels to Facebook. I remember when Facebook was just a class uh, thing. Um, Wayne Sutton, who has been featured in Black in America on CNN, who's been a very key leader in the startup world. At the time, he was still working in the media. I ran into him at a Raleigh gathering. He said, you should get on Twitter. It is a key place for Black people to be able to express themselves. That is why I was even on Twitter in the first place. Mm. I still have my given name as a handle, but what prompted me to change and brand myself as the Black Urbanist came when I, so I got, there were some layoffs, living in the RTP area wasn't working out. So I just scooted on back up uh, I-40, 85 and came home to Greensboro. I'm in my teenhood bedroom. So the house my mom and I lived in when I was a teenager. So I'm in my teenhood bedroom. I had gotten into UNCG for grad school. I had done call center work, I had done temp work. I mean, this is how I survived the recession of 08. And of course, mom, mom and dad have, have been adamant about just keeping it simple, keeping it lean. So we have just, we all had just enough house for us, just enough mortgage. Everybody had a vehicle because having a vehicle is important. But what I started to notice was that had a major um, car wreck in 20, in the spring of 2010. Oh. And um, he has um, he struggled with bipolar depression as well. And so he had a bad day. And that bad day resulted in a major accident or well, major pileup. I wouldn't say in that case, it's, you know, everybody gets into crash versus accident, but mental state was affected there. I don't think he intended to run through a stoplight, but or run, yeah, but he did. And so there were consequences to that. Thankfully, no criminal consequences, but it definitely changed his economic status. It changed his body. It was a miracle. He, he, cause he literally ejected from his vehicle and hit a telephone pole. Oh no. Yeah. So that happened in April of 2010. And so I watched him come back to semi life. I'm still mm -hmm. writing the original waxing philosophical blog. I'm still tweeting at my given name. I'm still asking questions around faith community, educational community, place making. And so, but I was also watching my dad come back to life and thinking about, okay, he's stuck at this rehab center, but there's only one and he's definitely not like accessible. He can't mm -hmm. really use his electrical license in the same way anymore because his, his brain is, he hit his head. So already mm -hmm. head issues. This was kind of another strike. He was able to, he had retired by this point. So he was able to stay in his home, but he couldn't drive for the longest time. So he had started walking around Greensboro. And any of you who know South Greensboro and know these areas I'm telling you about, and who remember may know my dad and remember my family and may remember seeing him walk around, walking to downtown. We only had Center City Park at the time. We hadn't, LaBauer was not planned yet in its full form, walking around there and you know, getting frustrated that there weren't places to use the restroom. Uh, GTA was definitely did not have the same headways as it has now. And of course, during What's this, GTA? our um, bus system. So our bus system was not as ro robust and kind of expected Southern city, everybody drives, but you know, there was a bus stop at the corner of our block. He ended up walking. He was walking around a lot more. Um, so basically, he was um, um, basically he was walking around and he was walking. I mean, he walked to um, Randolph County. Now, anybody who knows Central North Carolina, yes, Central North Carolina geography, Randolph County is the county directly south of Guilford. We live in South Greensboro. He walked straight down US 220 and I 73 oh. in the median. And on the side, he, he may have walked down Randleman Road. Now, Randleman Road is old 220. And so people who are NASCAR fans, this is kind of where the Petty family has their original garage. He mm -hmm. may have just walked down the old state highway, which is a two lane highway for the most part. Mm -hmm. But still, dad was not, I mean, this is a man who was, who had worked on tobacco farms at one point, worked at a chicken processing plant, worked at our barn theater theater. I mean, a working, very much a working class man. He's like, I'm not going to be stopped. My 
my mentor, my old foreman mentor has cancer. I may not have a vehicle. You may not be able to take me down there. And I don't necessarily want you to have to go down there and visit him. You know, I -hmm. know that he's kind of, you know, not culturally sensitive, but that's him. But I don't necessarily want you to talk to this man. So I'm going to walk to and from his home in Randolph County. Now, granted, he did not have to cross cross through downtown. He, we literally live off of US, the more businessy oriented US 220. And then the, the lighter version of 220 is on kind of the other side of the neighborhood. So he just had to just walk the neighborhood bounds. So yeah. maybe about a mile on one end, maybe about 500 feet to get out of the neighborhood to walk straight down um, US 220 main. Or he walks to the old one and just walks the sidewalk and then walks the, but yeah. That's a long way still. So watching my father deal with this, then in turn, going to grad school, sitting in my first urban politics seminar and only seeing the rep, there was no mention of things like say Tulsa, like the Greenwood Avenue corridor that we had had blocks of neighborhoods. Basically, in my urban politics textbook, we were either living in public housing or else. No mention of Black rural, Black farm communities, no mention of Black Wall Streets, Main Streets, just that the only way we were interacting with, say, the growth machine or things, yeah, economics period was in public housing. And again, I'm not ashamed of, you know, that's part of our story. I mean, I lived, by the time we, we moved to our street, it was mostly black neighborhood with some older white couples and it was a it was a more integrated neighborhood and that was that was just our story but that's yeah. not the full story and as a storyteller as someone who's always been interested in story as someone whose mom dragged her to the library and is creating these garments at home and the dinner table conversations that's what prompted me to say okay in this professional and intellectual and legal context, people need to know that if we're gonna call ourselves urbanists, there are black folks doing that and they are visible. And so the original goal was to start this as a conversation to primarily white folks who are writing these textbooks or people who are more invested in the white narrative of the story that we mm-hmm. exist. Throughout these remain these 10 years since all that happened. The journey has been mainly me growing up out of a tw- uh, you know twenty something surviving the Great Recession, growing out of the conservative church community that they also meshed me in a little bit. Growing into my gender identity, sexual orientation, being a proud woman who says a lot of things and is a feminist. And also thinking about the fact that I have peers that have been sorting through these questions. Some of them went and did it in an engineering program. Some of them went Mm -hmm. and did it in a sociology PhD program. Some of them are in public health. Some of them are doctors. Some of them are ministers and CDC uh, are runners. And, but I decided to do journalism. I had written in my um, seventh grade calendar that they gave us all you know, they had the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I'm like, journalist. That just, <laughs> that was the word. So All right. I am. Um, and then, you know, for me, I also, even though we were having these conversations around the family dinner table, it was a, I wanted to have an outside conversation. Mm-hmm. My family just couldn't believe that I was so enmeshed and fascinated with it. They probably also didn't see the economic case. And yeah. as a family full of first generation college students and technical graduates and people who went back to and did college, you know, a little later, the selling point was, of course, why, and of course, why we sell people, have been selling people in college for the past probably 20, 30 years, you go, you get more money, you don't have to just be an employee, you know, you, there's a, there's a lift there. But of course, we've seen that sometimes Black families, even if all the education we've done, it's for our personal benefit. It helps out when creating ventures like I create in creating a venture, but maybe not so much in working for a venture. So Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's kind of been the origin story. And so uh, basically I started out, I was blogging every week. This was still in the era of blogging every week, tweeting all the time, Facebook becoming more um, prevalent. 
Uh, I graduated from my master's program in twenty in, the, in May of 2012, uh, Master of Public Affairs program with a community and economic development concentration. Mm, okay. And I just started finding ways to plug in. I um, plugging into the APA community as much as I could back then when the rules were such that if you were strictly an economic development person, you'd still have to wait for a very long time. And that very long time is literally now for me under the old rules that I can sit for the exam. So sitting for the exam was a very different proposition for folks who were not mm -hmm. from a planning program. And that wasn't me. Right. I was a, I had a communication undergrad and I had a public affairs master with a, uh, of uh, CED concentration. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. So you've been involved in, in a ton of things. So, so I think a lot of people, um, at least who are listening here, may be familiar with your work um, through the Black Urbanist, mm -hmm. um, which is the, the blog, the, it's not even a, a, a I don't know if I, I, I think blog is, it almost sounds dated anyway. It is, it is. But, it's a multimedia platform at this point. <laughs> there we go. Now the column side of the degree is coming out here, but yes. Yeah, no, I get it. And ironically, you know, it's it's funny because um, at in seventh grade, I also said, if you'd asked me what I was going to be, I was going to be a journalist. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to show my age here, but I would have <laughs> said, I'm going to be the next Mike Royko. <laughs> who was the columnist in for the uh, Chicago papers mm -hmm. who got picked up where I lived in, in Cleveland. Yeah. Who was, yeah. who was the first, you know, sort of, sort of voice like that I'd ever been exposed to. And I was mm -hmm. like, I'm going to do that. And then I mm -hmm. started journalism school and went, these people are psycho. I'm not doing this. Yes. <laughs> yeah. but, but ironically, I'm back to doing something akin to journalism again in a lot of my life. So it's funky how we full circle. Well, like it's that. so easy, much easier now to own the means of production as journalists. And that's something. So I am, I'm a Maynard 200 fellow, the Maynard Institute of Journalism Education. I'm a, one of their inaugural fellows. And I was able to get some pathways into the media world because I was making something. And that I, um, I was named a fellow in 2018. And part of that was because, you know, I've created a platform. Uh, I've podcasted mm -hmm. before. They're still in the plans to come back mm -hmm. and do that. Uh, I, you know, and it's, but the thing is, you know, we're in this type of form where we just, you record once, you have multiple audio. And I've been thinking about how that works for me personally, mm -hmm. as well as clients that I may just work with on the media side, architects, engineers, planners economic development people who are like, I need to understand this environment. You know, I've seen, they'll say, I've seen this show. I've seen your other podcasts or Jeff Wood or some of the other people who are podcasting across all kinds of platforms. And we're, you know, like we're ready for it. Uh, and then of course, for me, I didn't want to stay up all night. And so we had technician at NC State. And of course, People may not think about NC State when it comes to the comm side. They think about Chapel mm. Hill. They think about the Daily oh. Tar Heel. But we also, we're actually the largest contingent institution in the UNC system. We're bigger than Chapel oh. Hill by huh. population. We also actually graduate more comms degree holders than we do engineers. All the dog on. Yeah, that's something that it's... And so we get to have our spring graduation in the legendary Reynolds Coliseum. Of course, this is, you know, anybody who knows your tobacco lore, sports lore, you know, this is where the Jimmy V cut down the nest. This is where um, mm. Norm Sloan cut down the nest. That was our, our legacy home. And so even though I did, I did a um, December graduation. So we actually graduated in another gym, which we still had a lot of people on the floor that year in 2007. Uh-huh. When my cousin graduated in 2014, um, actually, was it 20? No, it was 2018. He started in 2014, but in 2018, when he graduated, he did a spring graduation. They mm -hmm. thankfully put air conditioning in there because that was something. I, I mean, uh -huh. I, I think of, this may seem superficial, but I was like, I'm not going to burn up in my gown. Let me, oh, and I don't oh, really yeah. need the credits. So let me try to scrunch, scrunch up. And, you know, the recession was brewing in, 20, in 2007. I could see the writing on the wall. And again, college mm -hmm. was a practical thing. And so I struggled because, you know, media is not a, 
practical thing in some elements. We're seeing yet another role of media declines. And but we're going to miss something because I love to tell people that, especially when I do my stage uh, work, when I do my keynotes and everything, when I started as a undergrad at NC State, I used to go up to Hillsborough Street and I would go to the record exchange. And in front of the record exchange was what was then known as the Independent Weekly. It is now, of course, mm. Indie Week. The okay. alternative press was telling me about the city council meetings. It was telling me about black communities in a way. And then of course the black press, you know, in the case of Greensboro, we had Carolina Peacemaker, you know, all these press that wasn't massively white led male trust fund, you know, broadcast these small presses uh, that were still in some cases printing papers mm -hmm. right now, they're getting into the newsletter piece. Uh, so they're in people's inboxes every day. They're streaming on YouTube, they're streaming their audio. And so yeah. literally, you know, look at our setup. We're in, you know, offices and bedrooms with fancier mics. I mean, I have a little blue snowball over here. I'm on yeah. my back, book, but we're doing an international show. So I think, and I, and I, you know, bringing in that into the conversation for folks to, who are especially are raising money and thinking about how money distributes through cities and thinking about the role of your press. The fact that, and, and then of course I do public engagement consulting work as well. And so being able to go and call up whatever your daily paper is, but also those alt weeklies, also those key people who send out information who, mm -hmm. even though they may not vet it in the same way, they may still have, and honestly, I think everybody's got an opinion in journalism. Everybody's sharing their voice, but at the very least, they're favorable to what you want to say and how you want to say it and how you want to present it. And they will mm -hmm. present your who, what, where, and when in the way you need it to. As and long in, as they're factual, yes. And absolutely. they're factual. You know, obviously, yeah, yeah they, they need to be factual. And so that, I think, is the benefit now of where we are. And of course, mm -hmm. those of us who were in this digital environment before COVID-19 sent us inside to the house. We we know this, but now as we're learning, even though we can't be in the public sphere, even though we're using the public sphere right now more or less to protest and we're challenging what that public sphere is supposed to look like, but at the, be at the beginning of the day, you're at home, you're reading something, you're watching something, you're hearing something, and that's reinforcing your worldview. And mm -hmm. so I hope that we never get to a point where we don't have some sort of media outlet and that we continue to evolve. And that's really what I've evolved over the years and did. So, yeah. So, so one thing that you, you've articulated um, in your writing, in your work, in your speaking that I, I have been so grateful for is that you've taken the definition of urbanism and mm -hmm. broadened it beyond design. So mm -hmm. you mentioned you have, and, and you didn't go into your work history. You were, you were focusing on kind on your origin story. Yeah, um, yeah. But your work history involves a lot of work with, with organizations that, um, you know, are focused on kind of the physical design and the physical mm -hmm. functionality of the, the landscape, particularly in a conventional sort of city style format. Mm hmm and you were one of the first people that I heard say in who, who, who had basically stronger cred in that space, that mm -hmm. physical design space than I had, because I worked in that at a point in my career. And then I, I'm still an AICP, but I walked yeah. away from the, uh, yeah. from, from the physical planning part of, of work. I'm, you know, I've still got feet in both worlds, but I lean heavier on the economic development side. And even now that's probably questionable. Um, <laughs> but, but you were one of the first people that I heard say, this isn't just about how you design this physical space. Urbanism, the new urbanism mm -hmm. is not just about this stuff, but it's about the questions of how do people interface with this? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, and, for, and, and not only how do people interface with it, but how do people who are not basically the same as the overwhelming majority of the architects and the urban designers, i.e. 
heavily white, <laughs> most heavily, heavily cis, mm -hmm. and mostly male, especially mm -hmm. if you look at who the, the, the ones yeah. who yap are. Yeah. Um, you were one of the first people I knew who called out and said, that's not urbanism. That's mm -hmm. not the whole story. Mm -hmm. Just because you design it doesn't mean that you've made this accessible. And you beautifully said not too long ago um, that urbanism is really about the people. Yeah. And I loved that. So uh, mm -hmm. what what was leading you to, to think that? And, and you can probably unpack what you meant by that better, better than I can off well, of my scattered brain. Once again, that's why I said at the top of the show, dinner table conversations, literally where could we go? And of course that's evolved over the years because of course now I live in a partnership, a lesbian partnership. I, mm -hmm. there are some states where we can't adopt, like both of us can't adopt. Yeah. There are some places, and this gets into the debate that everybody loves to have over cars and whether we need cars. So say you have that perfect new urbanist plaza, say the hair salon in there only does straighten hair or they might touch your curls but most certainly not mine oh this stuff yeah yeah no no i get what you mean go ahead yeah not not my curliness and they definitely won't even make my like my my partner has like sort of like the flat top fade going on they might be scared to do that because she's woman identified mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so but that if that's the new urbanist plaza like i can't we can't walk to get our hair done like there's no walking to get our hair done and we might have to get in a car and go to somewhere, go to a neighborhood and probably a neighborhood in a predominantly black community that just gets it where I just walk in and say, hey, I have natural hair, trim it up, wash it up. Or mm -hmm. she goes to, and honestly, she actually goes to a, a women owned barber salon. Oh, does she? Awesome. Yes. And so they are, now they will say this, um, they're located in DC, Lady Clipper Barbershop. They are not an exclusively, um, Mm -hmm. LGBTQ space, but they are friendly. Like it's Got all it. women, and so for a lot of women, even um, not non-black women, uh, it, you know, there's that whole barbershop culture. And so once again, that gets into sort of the gender identity piece across ethnicity. Do you feel comfortable walking into certain hair spaces? But it's a very important part of who we are. And so, and then yeah. also, there's a lot of um, discussion where you're not. Some places have, it's not just you go in and they just cut your hair and they don't talk to you. It's a public square for a lot of people yeah. to be able to go in these places. And that's something that's been missing in this COVID moment where we can't necessarily be in tight spaces or if we're back in these hair spaces, everybody is in masks and face shields and you're just going in and getting done what needs to get done and then yeah, hoping for the have best. A lot of, yeah, you can't have a lot of, of you know, debate over the the... <laughs> The, the issues of today. When you describe that, you're describing the functionality mm -hmm. of the the physical, you know, this, this idealized square with the cute little shops all the mm -hmm. way around it. And it seems like you're coming up against um, two things to use that that story. Mm -hmm. One is that you're, you're seeing that that story is of a very narrow segment of the population. Yeah. Um, sometimes, you know, sometimes the critique has been, I work with a lot of, um, you know, folks who are trying to, to, and I, and I come from a, you know, I assure you that when I was growing up, if you would tell me that I would ever pay $5 for a cup of coffee, <laughs> I, I would have been so <laughs> utterly bewildered that like it, it just, my head would have exploded or something like that. So, so, you know, there's there's a huge part of the population that isn't included when your idealized environment is places like that mm -hmm. or places that are the um, shishi hair salon that doesn't know how to do um, natural hair mm -hmm. um, or the place where, you know, fill, fill in the blank, fill in the blank. Um, so it becomes it's a very simplistic definition. And and. I th in in your story with the hair salon, I think you you really articulate a piece of that beautifully. Um, 
which is that these spaces have to be, or, or maybe they can't be multidimensional. And if that's not physically possible, number one, they should be to the greatest extent possible given the physical environment. But number mm -hmm. two, mm -hmm. how do you redesign an urbanism that isn't based on this sort of sanitized Mayberry <laughs> ideal and design an urbanism or even, you know, God love Jane Jacobs, but yeah, you know, the, the Greenwich village that, that she talked about is not a place that can exist in a lot of places. Greenwich village was unique and is mm -hmm. still mm -hmm. unique mm -hmm. because of what it is. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of that that gets left out of the story when we just focus on, um, let's make this great place where everybody can walk and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah. And of course, you know, as, as a woman, you don't, or as a, a woman, I'm sorry, I'm still working on. Yeah. Woman identified. Yeah. On the language. Um, as a, as a, as a woman identified person mm -hmm. or a person who presents outwardly mm -hmm. as female, mm -hmm. that's, there's a whole nother layer on these urban environments that is, that's not cute and pretty and sunny and happy, but it can be scary. Yeah. And we don't always deal with that in no. the urbanist conversation. We are just now really sinking into Kimberly Crenshaw's intersectionality and how it dovetails with legalities and our written environment even though ironically apa was built on a foundation of court cases you know mm -hmm. you when you take the exam even when you're in planning school if you take an urban planning class you take courses about what's a nuisance what's um uh what is it a taking all these are legal mm -hmm. terms and so it's time to add intersectionality in there as well it's been long since time to do that because she wrote that back in the early 90s i mean i was in kindergarten when she wrote that and so yeah, okay, some of us weren't in kindergarten, but that's the point. That's the point. You know, <laughs> some of y'all were out here working, yeah. raising kids in these offices. This is something that has black a black woman wrote this years ago and applied it, and here we are, nearly thirty years later, and we're just now realizing that she was right in some se yeah. in some sectors. Now, yeah. uh, of course, there have been always other been sectors. Shout out to all of the the CDCs and the grant and the loan funds and all the people who understand that you have to think about yeah. our legacy of this country. You go back to 1619, the fact that some folks that were brought to these shores, we were brought this property to build for. And that's the root of what's going on right now. You know, even those of us who read 1619 Project, those of us who live it in our bones, or those of us in this current moment mm -hmm. who are waking up to disparities. You know, we woke up to health disparities, a lot of us, with this crisis. You know, none of us were alive with the last time we all had the mass quarantine. So we're writing that story. And to see how we were able to rewrite so quickly, okay, we all need to stay at home. We all need to wear masks. We all need to do carry out. The kids are going to learn in a completely digital space or not. And so yeah. there's all these layers. And so literally... It comes down to things like intersectionality, implicit bias, which is that judgment you make when you walk into a space and you make that judgment. I mean, it, it can be people, but it can also be back to that uh, $5 coffee example. You know, okay. now we're got, we've now moved to the point where I can't imagine paying $10 for a cup of coffee, but we're getting there too. Yeah. Welcome you, to DC. Yeah, I was going to say, you're, Welcome you're, to you're DC. in this really cool place called DC and I'm like in the <laughs> you know, in the Midwest. So yeah, you know. just this. And uh, once again, you know, where, where we're coming together and where I think, and this is where the pressure's getting hit there. Are, and, and this COVID moment kind of taught people, do I really need that $10 cup of coffee? Do I really need to be in the space or, and then on the flip side, the, and that's the folks who are transplanted, mostly white, young people, mm -hmm. you know, all the people who are attracted to DC because it's where you go. We watch West Wing and we said, this is where you go. Yeah. Now, my attraction to this metro region was this is where people like Chuck Brown, who yeah. generations ago drove up, got on the train or I or drove up 995. I can't remember. I don't know how he did his migration, how his parents moved him here. But he got 
in some transportation vehicle and they brought him here and he had the creative environment to create a whole genre of music. Yeah. Likewise, yeah. George Clinton, same thing. He left Eastern North Carolina and created a genre of music. I so, didn't realize he was from Eastern North Carolina. Yeah. They yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, Roberta lot. Flack, Nina Simone, so many cultural producers have been able to leave what well, had to leave. You know, we mm -hmm. could generations ago, it was not safe for black totally. bodies. And in some cases, we still say black bodies are not safe. That's why we're saying Black Lives Matter at this moment. And specifically, black trans and black queer lives matter because. There's still all these distinctions of bias. We look at a body and we expect the body to be a certain way. Mm -hmm. Some of that comes from religious training. Some of that comes from capitalism or just what we're, what's expected to be a product. Like we expect bodies to be a product. And so, yeah, mm -hmm. all of that comes into play because you could build your beautiful apartment building with those granite countertops. And I guess granite is still the thing they're putting in residential. Who knows? You could... <laughs> All these co-working spaces that have been empty for months, the poor people working for we well, I mean, obviously if you're work you're working at WeWork, you probably are making enough in your company. But I can see aspirational people say, Well, if I go and I get an office at WeWork, WeWork has a name, then and of course now it's it's still not fair that they're binding them in their lease contract. The whole point mm -hmm. of that was to open up the office, class A office space for flexibility. And that's the point, you know, you can be flexible in some things like right now we've been flexible because this is everybody's been talking in this manner. Everybody's been coming to these Zooms and webinars. Mm -hmm. But where was the flexibility when it came to educating students of different backgrounds and understanding that trauma is different? Where is the flexibility and understanding why certain apparatuses of public safety do not work the same? Healthcare systems. You know, it's not just numbers on the page for how many patients you treat. Literally, there are areas of this country that are missing hospital capacity, and there are people that have died because they do not have hospital beds. And so if you just get stuck with, oh, I built a, uh, if you built a building and you're only focused on its condo conversion model, or if you're only focused on one kind of use, even if you're focused on like, oh yeah, it has that eyes on the street, but what? Is, who are those eyes? And what are they looking at? And what are they looking for? Going back to Jane, one of those Jane Jacobs examples uh, to kind of talk about a contemporary of Jane Jacobs, somewhat of a contemporary. I mean, Lorraine Hansberry also lived in Greenwich Village, but mm -hmm. she found more refuge in Harlem. We get a raisin in the sun because she fa truly found her community in Harlem and found herself, but she was back and forth. Her, yeah. I'm reading, I'm um, looking for Lorraine right now. And it's also gonna go on the book club list, which um, speaking of that, I guess I um, I should make sure people know like- Well, we're gonna, yeah, let's, let's, let's get to that. Can I ask one more question before we get to that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, just, just because I don't wanna like get to that and then jump back and, yeah, and, yeah. and so on. Um, when it comes to, I, I, you put, I think you put your finger on something really profound there when you talked about intersectionality, implicit bias, and um, flexibility in in looking at kind of that physical context. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to kind of kind of put a pin in that because I think that's that's something really profound, and mm -hmm. I would love to pursue that with you a little bit more at mm -hmm. some point. I want to think about that. So before we talk about the next stuff you're doing, do you have, because I know you're a, an absolutely voracious reader, which should come, which comes with the territory, mm -hmm. um, anything that you would recommend that people uh, read or look at from yourself or from others um, with regard to understanding kind of that intersection between implicit bias and that more narrow definition of urbanism? I don't. I don't know if I have anything specific, like literally you, there are names that are floating around the Twitterverse mm -hmm. right now. And anybody that specifically black women, anything that the black women's names that you've seen either in the US or Canada, and they said mm -hmm. to read, absolutely read it. Now my book list mm -hmm. is centered on the black queer feminist experience. So yes, those things are covered, but this is like kind of a specific channel. So when you go to the blackurbanist.com slash resources, there's several books there that touch mm -hmm. on specifically women and queer women and just LGBTQ in general. Uh, yeah. The Black experience is there. 
I mean, if anything, I've been living this moment for a very long time. This is year 10. Yeah. And so put inserting myself as a black body, as a black voice in conversations, both in predominantly white rooms, predominantly male rooms, even within class privileged black uh, rooms, that's been my what I've been doing now for mm -hmm. a decade. So mm -hmm. the next move and what I'm most concerned about right now is that we're going to read everything that's being circulated around, but taking action is key. What, yeah. what action has that inspired in you to do? Because it's okay to do the book club, but what actions are you going to take? It's not just um, doing things, but what are you going to fund? Like literally funding, money, thinking about how money is conducted, thinking about who's been doing this and whether or not they're fully funded to do the work. Because sometimes you don't even need to do it all. Sometimes you need to find the resource yes. that's already been created. So yeah, mm -hmm. I created the Black Queer Feminist book list. It's, um, you can go to it and I have like, it's curated. Um, now note those are affiliate links when you go to that site, when you go over to bookshop.org, that, but that's the oh, way good. it supports. It goes back, it, it turns around and you're supporting someone who's been doing the work and you can learn, but then if you need even more help with it, you can reach out to me and we can have, or honestly, right now, I've, that's why I've created these equity caucuses. And I call it, yeah. that's really what they are. You know, they're book clubs, but they're split down kind of an ethnicity line because there's certain, just like we were having the conversation about the hair salon, there's just certain mm -hmm. things that if you're, if the purpose is for you to come to the ally session to get, become an ac accomplice and abolitionist, and that's what you need to do as a teacher and as a facilitator, I need to be able to focus on that. And then if I want to have an internal conversation in my own community or in communities of color and how we've been made to be like measured right. against whiteness, certain yeah. things have happened to us, certain properties, grants, schools, things have only been available to us in certain aspects, having that conversation. We're still having a conversation about gender and sexuality inside of the black community. And so having that yeah. space, we're still having it inside women identified people. We're still having that continuum of a conversation. And then you go outside. And so it's like a, the greater women identified community is having that conversation of uh, class levels, uh, regionalisms, all these different things. And that's why I am um, a firm believer in having in an educational setting, having some mixed classes of different types of people and having that be the educational experience, but then mm -hmm. also having certain people coming together. And so that's sort of been the linchpin of what I've been doing now. Um, so, so let's make sure that we give people a good, clear idea on <laughs> what you've been doing now, because if all they've encountered is this conversation, yes, I want them to know exactly where and how as appropriate to to plug in with you and to support your work. Because mm -hmm. one of the things that you identified, journalism is fantastic. Journalism is, is enormously needed, but journalism isn't getting funded. I got to yeah. not whack the desk. Yeah, um, <laughs> no, it's <laughs> wah, wah, wah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but journalism is not getting funded. And that means that, um, you know, the model isn't there yet for mm -hmm. important voices that we need to hear to get heard. Yeah. And so you've looked at several different ways to do that. So, so as we close out here, why don't you give us a run, give us, give us a, an overview of, of the channels that you're pursuing right now. So, so promote the hell out of yourself. And uh, <laughs> so you know, of course this sure is people really know. So okay. this is the 10th anniversary of the black urbanist multimedia platform. And so about uh, four years ago, I started using Patreon as a means to collect donations, but I realized that there was an opportunity there. And so what I've seen in the last few years is that what I'm most passionate about doing is teaching and teaching at a certain level. And then we start having longer conversations. Now you still can reach out to me, especially when this uh, pandemic is over and talk to me about keynotes. Um, I still do some public engagement work 
but that's literally okay. a case by case basis. Don't expect me to just don't just send me DMs about, hey, I need an equity consultant. That is not the best way to contact me right now. The best way to contact me is through what I have created through these book clubs slash equity caucuses. So I'm literally creating new social networks for folks who are engaged in this urbanism space. The first one I created is for its tagline is divest to invest is the um, is the LGBTQ affirming uh, feminist urbanist um, book um, you know book club like I, I can't the name is is different places I'll definitely make sure the link is there but there's a space specifically for people of color black indigenous and folks of other cultures who do not consider themselves white, but they're definitely not black or of the native, mm -hmm. um, either on the US side of the border, the Canadian side or the Mexican side, wherever you are, you consider yourself a black person, you are a member of a native tribe, recognized or not, or you are in the Latina community or you're in the Asian community and you're having, you have, you see yourself as a marginalized, racialized, colonized person in some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. And so that social network is invitation only, and it is available. Basically, you can go to, you can go, actually, the, the homepage for all this is theblackurbanist.com slash circles. Start okay. there if you want to uh, go to join any of these places. So theblackurbanist.com slash circles. The first one I describe is this space for people of color. And that's where we have a book club there. All the book clubs are starting off with um, Chocolate Cities, The Black Map of American Life, um, that wonderful book. And I'm going to have a conversation with one of the authors on a Wednesday, July 1st. Wednesday, July 1st is when I start launching content. So depending on when this conversation is archived, if you're listening to it live this Wednesday, if you sign up for these entities by this Wednesday, you'll have access to a conversation from the author and breaking down chapter by chapter uh, this book and some of the other books in the Black Queer Urbanist um, book list will also become be part of the canon. It'll be video content, it'll be audio content, it'll be on-demand content. And for people of color who identify as such and, I, and identify as Black and Indigenous, I've created a platform that's the book club and sort of a private social network. Um, those of you who are familiar with Mighty Networks, it works on that platform. And so it's invite, it is free of charge, invite only at this moment. And I'm the main one. There are questions that I ask you just so, once again, like any other sort of semi-private group and a caucus of people asking you to kind of respect that space. Yeah. That's the first space. The second that's space, which is probably the most relevant for this group is what I call the Allies Educational Circle, the Black Queer Feminist uh, Books and Ideas Salon, Allies Educational Circle is the full name. But effectively, this is what you get if you go to patreon.com slash Kristen E. Jeffers. And at the $40 level, if you consider yourself a white or even a person of color who's more of the ally scheme, if you're, you're just starting this conversation with um, deconstructing your relationship with whiteness or white privilege or white supremacy, or of course you have a European um, ancestry. Mm -hmm. This is a space, it is a $40 a month space, subscription space. Now I, I'm still working out the um, mechanics, but I think I'm gonna run it through 90 networks as well, but it will, right now you can go to Patreon, pledge the $40 level and you'll get access to that space. And eventually you'll be able to go directly to Mighty Networks for $40 a month and also get access to this space. And okay. so in there, it's web, it's phone, it'll be phone friendly, just the book club videos. There won't be a lot of okay. discussion in the ally space. It is primarily educational. Now in the person of color space, there's heal, there's check-in calls, there's healing circles, there's I there's time that we spend together being ourselves and dwelling as ourselves and recovering Which is from crucial. Yes. Right. Yeah. And then but I wanted to make sure that people were knew about these things. Once again, like you found me years ago, people are still Googling and finding the whole concept of urbanism and urban planning and all the disparities. And they're still learning that there's so many different black organizations like Black Space and so many leaders like Jay Pitter and Dr. Destiny Thomas and Tamika Butler and others who are 
doing have been doing this work, and you've probably seen those names over and over again, especially in this current moment. But for you, for me, I wanted to teach a LGBTQ-focused, Black, feminist-focused set of books. I wanted these to be in the canon. I wanted people to have that educational moment. And so when you pledge at the $40 level on Patreon, not only will you get, are you getting that information and mm -hmm. access to that information, it'll be on demand and the videos will be such that you can show them in a classroom. Like we can work out that. And if you're an organization that wants a set of videos or wants white labeled videos, there's gonna be a special level for you. You can reach out directly to me and we'll do a corporate version of that. But this is the individual version. This is an mm -hmm. individual license. And I'd ask that you, if you are a individual, you pledge at that $40 level. But if you are a corporation, nonprofit, foundation entity, that you reach out directly to me um, on the site to get a version crafted for you at a price point that's appropriate for you and having multiple people view it. Because part of this is a version of creating a reparational environment. You're paying it forward to Black, Indigenous, and other people of color who mm -hmm. have, who are, you know, are underpaid, who are overtasked, who are overwhelmed and burnt out. And they get a space free of charge that they can then you can also donate back if you're if you're a black indigenous person of color who happens to have wealth or happens to be able to donate extra you can always there's a there's a patron level for you as well you can always pledge the 40 dollar level but i'll just put you in the other space because that's going to be more you know around your speed or you can kind of donate at any patron level but white and white aligned folks that $40 level is kind of all that you get for this and you're paying it forward. And entities and corporations that are interested in this educational content, reach out to me directly so we can create a special level for you so that you can, if you're looking for an opportunity to pay it forward to black planners, urbanists, creators, cultural producers at this moment through my platform, this is what, this is the best way to do it. Individual mm -hmm. patron donations, corporate level support through a, a means that we can craft together one-on-one. Um, -on -one. And then the last thing you'll see on the Circles website, again, I'm a, com I'm a comms person, I'm a writer, I'm a, I consider myself a media person. And so I'm very concerned about our media literacy and our media tool use. And mm. I talked about that multiple times today because I think it's very important. It's great that we have these tools. It's great that we're no they're no longer toys, but it's vital where we're going to find these solutions is not just going to be outside, but it's also going to be, especially in a moment like this, when we're supposed to be safer at home, being able to find this information digitally and take these courses digitally. And of course, different schools, universities, colleges, K-12, the educational environment is going to look different. So that's why I conceived of having this book club with, you know, book talks. And then also yeah. a course specifically for communications, um, media tool uh, mastery and media literacy mastery. Now, I intentionally plan to start that on July 10th, but I'm going to hold that back. That's going to start a little later this fall, but it will be a premium course. If you pledge at the $80 level on Patreon, that will give you a slight discount on that course. And once again, this is a pay it for it notion. This is a way to support me, support this work, support 10 years worth of resources, support me in this moment where I can't physically travel to places. I can't right. physically necessarily do keynotes in the same way and may not be able to do that for a while. And I want to be able to, I, I love, I actually do love educating people. I do love sharing information. I do love consuming information. I love reading. I love writing. It's been implanted in me. And of course, not everybody, especially not everybody Black, not everybody in the LGBTQ community, not every woman identified person is your educator yeah. or should be your educator. And it is not their sole domain in your space to be that person. They are not obligated to do it. And honestly, they can start the conversation and then leave it. Because once it becomes an obligation, no matter where you are in the space, that's where you are. And so I want to add that caveat to anything that I do. This is what I'm doing in the moment. I also have a newsletter. It's, it's mostly weekly. And I'm working on bringing that back as it supports these circles. But the mm -hmm. main thing right now is fundraising through creating these educational opportunities, as well as just saying to people, hey, 
we can create educational educational content together, or mm -hmm. you can just pay it forward. You can there's a means and a way to fund me or have me as a mentor, sponsor me that we can create. And if you want to think about capital sponsorship of a, of this platform and resource, if you're concerned about the state of the media, if you're concerned about urbanism media, if you're concerned about local government media, mm -hmm. there's an opportunity here through me, starting at the individual level, and then moving onward to institutional levels to support me and others like me who are also going to be underneath this umbrella. And supporting people like you, you and people like you who are underneath this umbrella, I think is one of the most important things we can do be doing in this moment. I haven't signed up for your Patreon yet. Um, mm -hmm. I've got lots of excuses for why I haven't <laughs> done that, but that's happening. If not today, then tomorrow. Um, Yay. <laughs> Gord, Gord will and the creek don't rise. If that's yeah. And a... anybody who joins you in doing that, we're going to have a conversation with our first author. And there's some other authors who've already reached out to who want to have a conversation with me. So that'll be part of the bonus. And people who have wanted to pick my brain for years, who have enjoyed watching me this hour and watching and listening, if you want to see my face come in and talk to you again and reading rainbow style about urbanist books, that's what you're buying into and doing this. And for those of you who share my intersections and identities, I am here for you as a resource and a coach and as someone who's done it now, once again, I've, I've kind of given you my age markers here. So I'm at that point in my career. But if you are just coming out of college, if you're in high school, I'm still going to be an old, old fogey for y'all. So, you know, <laughs> I can meet you in the middle here or I can meet your child in the middle. I can meet yeah. your young professional. I know a lot of you, I'm still, you're, you're hearing my age markers. You're like, oh my gosh, you are my, you know, I can meet you where you are. Mm -hmm. And then there are going to be, this is going to be an energy. These are going to be intergenerational conversations. You may notice the one thing I haven't said was that this is going to be age defined communities. If you can access the technology, now that, now that is a thing I have been thinking about um, ableism and ageism and things of that nature. And that's what raising money is going to do. I will be able to raise the money to properly have captioning, ASL, Braille in some cases, and right. then also okay. having assistance for folks who want to access these spaces and they're still adjusting to the technological changes. And all, because all of those things cost money mm -hmm. and there should not and is not outside of this kind of model, a way for the black urbanist to do this out of sunshine, rainbows and exposure. <laughs> People wonder if I, you know, people who've been watching me for years have probably noticed I've disappeared sometimes. Mm -hmm. I have always had, up until like literally recently, I've always had something else to do. And of course that helps, you know, I'm, I am not going to like pretend that I haven't been advantaged by being in a, a romantic partnership and we, you know, a household together. But there were times where it was just me. Yep. And I've had to work in organizations. I've had to be running somebody else's PR Mm -hmm. prominent mm -hmm. organizations. I worked in state humanities. I worked in Head Start. I've worked with um, Bike Walk KC, which is, um, you know, bike advocacy. Those, of course, your employer, you know, I've had to do that. And I've been employed and doing this. Yeah. You know, I buried my father in 2013 and that blog was in year three. And of course, his inspiration is all over the page. So that happened. I've had, you know, we've had some other health scares. We've had some other financial scares, natural disasters, you know, all kinds of things have happened. Of course, people know that I've moved to various different cities. So, yeah, that has all contributed to my ability to service things, um, whether or not you get a podcast anymore. And there is a patron level that if you just want the newsletter and old podcast episodes, that's available to you as well. If you're mm -hmm. not ready for the book club, but know that with that book club think about what you would be spending at barnes and noble think about what you're not ordering on amazon mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but you know you buy a hardback book you buy a drink and and a, and a pastry maybe that's what i'm thinking about the oh, pastry yeah. <laughs> and the drink because i mean our drinks yeah. are five to seven and that pastry is three dollars and that three dollar pastry is bothering me the most probably i'm like it's <laughs> it's a cookie why is my it's cookie three dollars very good right yeah no probably but like, like, yeah, exactly. Bake your cookies 
and give your money to me and my book club and supporting the intellectual conversations as well as the action generating conversations we need to have across the board, across generations, across our identities, so that when we're ready to actually go outside and mass again, when it is safe to do so, Mm -hmm. We're going outside and we're collecting. You know, we're not just going outside to demand our rights. We're going outside with rights, with, you know, with a positive space, with, you know, what we need. And of course, right now, I would, you know, definitely everybody wear your mask, be mindful where you are, know what, know what your plans are. And of course, follow the lead of anybody who is creating an action. Absolutely. Um, you know, don't, you know, the one, if you're compelled to action, especially if you're a white person, if you're compelled to action right now and, you know, your first mind is like, oh, I'm going to go outside and do it. Yeah. Really think about what that's going to mean. And if you're just in the point where you're just learning, come to my book club or come to someone else's book club, but definitely come to my book club because that's where you're going to be able to get that um, insight. Exactly. exactly. Give a, the Patreon uh, link again one more time, please. It's on patreon.com slash Kristen, K-R-I-S-T-E-N-E, Jeffers, J-E-F-F-E-R-S. So you got the E in the middle as well. So yeah, yeah. How do you pronounce it? I always thought it was Patreon. I've always said Patreon and then you're, okay. a, you're a patron. It's like the extra sure. E is there. It's really just patron. It's okay. with a, yeah, it's. Who knows? But and once again, these tools that are available, this is really just a tool. This is a, um, yeah. you know, this is a, a means to support me. It's um, now it's not once again, I'm not a nonprofit. I am a a socially minded, socially conscious for profit media organization. But of course, if you are if you're a media funder, if you are a foundation funder and of course, since if you are that person, you know, kind of how things can get funded and you're interested in the social justice and the benefit of society content that I'm producing and need some means of help connecting with me. We can have that conversation. I do have access to fiscal people that I can work with if you want to support this in mass. If you are a, a K-12 or a university educational institution and you want resources around that, reach out to me as well. We can arrange something. But individuals watching this, Start with the Patreon, start with mm -hmm. the blackurbanist.com slash circles and see what spaces are most appropriate to you. And if you are interested in that communications class, absolutely let me know. Once I get at least one pledge for that, I'll start creating content for that. But for now, yeah. I'm still waiting on my first pledge for that. And the plan is to start servicing the book club caucuses on July 1. All right, which is coming up. So you, you're going to be a busy woman here. Um, yes. <laughs> So wonderful. Well, thank you so much for taking the time, Kristen. Um, your your insight, your connections, your perspective, I do think are, are crucial. And it's been it's been an honor to be able to watch you growing. And uh, you know, growing doesn't stop just because you you know get yeah. some magic number. Mm -hmm. um, and and I've I've said I've enjoyed watching people grow who are a whole lot older. Yeah. Um, but it's 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 cool. So yeah, and really thank you it. for support over the years. Like just for anybody who wants to know, we you know the times we met in person. Like the, the last time I was in Cincy, like that night and everything you did that night, and for those oh. who were involved, that was crucial. And the oh, question you asked, and yeah, but this was um, a streets blog meetup, and yeah, so. It was. Yeah. And literally, um, and uh, if you don't mind, I'll bring this question back to the forefront because I think it still goes to identity. You know, why women, some of us women still feel like we can only date at the mental level and, you know, why we would tolerate certain smartest boy urbanist activities. <laughs> some of the worst social smartest boy urbanist activities and you know, for a lot of us, and of course, for me, you know, I was still evolving. And this is one way. And now it's like, okay, I don't have to just make that finite choice. But there is definitely something to be said. And it gets back to implicit bias. You know, think about your circles. Think about the kinds of people you're listening to, who you're listening to. And and also think about the conversations they're having. Because once again, something that's dinner table conversation for me, for some mm -hmm. other women, it's like, oh, you're this great genius person. Or 
Some people go to engineering school just to collect a degree and just say, hey, but please, that's something else. Please just don't do that. These are vital things of our society. These are vital parts of our society. It's not just about collecting knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's not, especially not in this moment. We have literally people dying at the hands of police mm -hmm. and vigilantes, and we have people dying from a disease that just popped up six, like less than six months ago. Mm -hmm. If you're still kind of stuck in the intellectual realm only, push your something done. So I, I wanted to thank you for that night. And I absolutely am very oh. appreciative of this conversation. This has been a great one. Wonderful. Well, thank you again, Kristen. And um, we'll have uh, lots of lots more conversations along these lines to come, I hope. Yes. Both um, as a result of the circles and uh, maybe here again. Yeah. So, take care. Be safe. Um, my best to less. Um, I'm I'm happy as hell for thank for, you. For both of you. Yeah, All definitely right. check out her stuff as well. It's a lot. It's right. especially a brand new um, thing she's launching. So definitely keep your eyes out for that too. And and less is um, her her. I know her Instagram is less is more. Less equal more. Less equal more. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, where should people look for her work? Um, uh, literally go to endoqueer.com. Um, That's the newest thing we're launching. She is um, an endo endometriosis um, mm -hmm. per person that has endometriosis and they call themselves endo warriors. So that's the newest thing she is launching. Uh, look out for that. We're going to be creating a community around that. Literally we're locking in. She just, she's participating. That's been kind of her thing during quarantine that oh, she okay. is doing. Also the Be A Beacon podcast, which is conversations. If you want to hear about queer life, all kinds of queer life. It's available on every podcast provider, Be A Beacon podcast, hosted by her. Okay. We're gonna be doing a design conversation with um, women like her, black masculine center leaning women. That's gonna be coming up later in July. It's gonna be a live forum like this and I'm gonna be moderating that. So that that is part of something that I'm doing that we're doing together. Uh, and then she is also, uh, there's, there's cards so like you can go to lesslighthouse.com or follow her at less equal more for more information about her work. And of course we, we work in tandem. She's also not a stranger to sort of local government world. She's been a transportation advocate. She's worked oh. with several transportation organizations. She's been frontline um, operator in the Hampton roads area, frontline ferry operator. So this is where once again, you wouldn't, you never know who might be thinking about, how cities work and how they can work better. Don't discount the person who's driving your bus. Yeah. Don't discount the person who's working behind the counter or checking Absolutely. out your groceries, especially not right now with the Absolutely. way this world has shaken out. So at less Absolutely. equal more on Twitter and Instagram and endoqueer.com is launching as a platform for anybody who might be here who's in addition to doing all this city planning and city making work is dealing with that particular health issue, yeah. specifically if you are in the LGBTQ community and the assumption is that that's not something you deal with, so. Amen, amen. Yeah. All right. Thanks a ton, Kristen. Yeah. A, a, a fount of incredible stories and knowledge and insight and you're, I think, pioneering some really important stuff, both in terms of, of the content and in terms of the, the structure. So, yeah, thank okay. you. All righty, cool. We will talk soon, okay? All right, take All care. Right. Take care of yourself. I'll see you. Bye. Bye. It's preeminently the time to speak the truth frankly and boldly. Nor need we shrink from honestly facing conditions in our country today. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror.